First of all, thank you very much for your time now and for the presentation you gave this morning at the Starbucks event. Welcome. Okay. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, how observations are used to track uh, both asteroids and uh, space debris and uh, how somehow this uh, process leads to a mismatch between uh, available catalogs like, I guess, the space track, the one given by space track, and the uh, observations you perform in the Amos space. Uh, are you working on uh, building your own catalog? And if so, how are you going to use it, or are you already using it? We uh, compute the orbits of the objects we observe uh, for computing the catalog. We do not maintain a catalog uh, continuously, because uh, we are mainly now using our telescopes uh, for selling observations to others. Uh, so we have done it uh, during a specific period of time. Uh, those times we have encountered some objects that are not uh, published in the mm -hmm. public catalogs, and and we normally keep it keep them uh, in our catalog. We we try to track them more often uh -huh. than we do with the others, just to first ensure that it is a true object, because mm -hmm. it may be the case that uh, you observe something which indeed is a false detection. Mm -hmm. So first you need to discard that indeed it was not in the catalog because it was not mm -hmm. an, a real object. And then, if it is a real object, we, we keep track of them just because of the interest of knowing something that the others don't want to publish. But uh, actually, there is no reason for publishing them. Mm -hmm. So we don't, okay. no, there is no need. But we don't um, get them behind or just avoid to observe mm -hmm. them. We are also working on uh, catalog maintenance for other institutions. Um, so they, are, we, they receive uh, the observations from our sensors and other sensors, and we process those data for them. And uh, these objects are there, uh, but normally they are not shared among the community uh, because of agreements with uh, third party countries. And uh, what's the main use of uh, people you interact with in terms of uh, uh, making use of your data? And how are they stored? Are they like the two line elements you mentioned, or mm -hmm. do you? It depends. It depends. I, uh, there are some people who uh, want to receive the observations and process the data coming from the telescopes by themselves. Okay. So, for computing the orbits, computing the catalogs, or identifying their maneuvers, calibrating their maneuvers within. Uh, with that data. There are some other people who just want to receive the orbital information and we process them. So it, the, the, the kind of exchange is different, whether we provide uh, optical data and uh, we, we try to use a standardized format or a grid format, which is particular customer, which may impose you the interface, um, or we exchange orbital information. If that's the case, we normally don't exchange two-line element format because it's a uh, of lower accuracy okay. of other kind of uh, formats. Additionally, because if you use other formats, you can attach covariance okay. information, the uncertainty of the orbit, okay. which is useful and needed for some particular application. Okay. So, uh, about the fact that some people are getting the raw observations, do you see a space, a business case for uh, uh, working on that part of the process? So, extracting the mm -hmm. Uh, data from uh, raw observations, or do you think this is going to remain something in the hands of, uh, uh, let's say, public institutions? Um, indeed, there is a business case, even though if there are public institutions taking care of the catalog maintenance, mm -hmm. both in America and in Europe, um, these public institutions are, are relying also on industrial or research partners which own the sensors. For example, we do have mm -hmm. telescopes okay. and we provide public institutions uh, with our observations so they can compute uh, the orbits out of them. Okay. So there's a business case mm -hmm. indeed. It's not big uh -huh. uh, because there are also some public uh, uh, sensors, some public telescopes and radars, uh -huh. uh, which are also used by these public institutions, but something, some things can be done. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's going to be the case even after the Spain's Fed is, is ready? Um, or maybe that's going to wipe out? You are absolutely right. The space fans will change uh, things. It is true that the space fans is a radar, so it will observe yeah. the lower part of the orbital regime. Okay. For telescopes, I think there will be still room for 
for doing observations apart of that. And even in the case of the LEO regime, where space fans will work and will provide an enormous amount of data, uh, space fans belongs to the American uh, mm -hmm. government somehow. So the other countries have the intention of having their own mechanism, their own capability to maintain catalog. And uh, there will be room for everybody mm -hmm. at the end. Okay. Nice. And about uh, the uncertainty you use uh, to let's say, give more accurate description of uh, the observations you make. Uh, is a covariance uh, indicator enough for modeling the kind of error associated to the observations? Mm -hmm. Or are you maybe looking also for giving confidence intervals using epistemic uncertainty? Uh, in particular, epistemic, I'm thinking about the thing you said about, uh, uh, so you observe a rotating object in the sky and uh, you see a truck but you're not sure whether the position of the spacecraft is at the end mm -hmm. of the track uh, because that's associated, that position is associated to the final time of the exposure mm -hmm. yeah. or whether that's rotating and so you stop seeing the object. So are you, uh, are you just giving, let's say, the position and the ellipsoid around the object or... Okay. Uh, I would, I would differentiate two things. Um, in order to uh, skip the problem of the rotating uh, mm -hmm elements and the rotating objects and the impact on the accuracy of the objects, we try to avoid the trains. So we save that part. Okay. We try to uh, do the uh, uh -huh. point source observation as much as possible. But anyhow, the observations have an intrinsic uncertainty that you have to deal with mm -hmm. and that will impact in the orbital accuracy you can get. Not only that, the orbital accuracy will degrade because you do not know perfectly well the dynamics. Mm -hmm. You don't know the rotation state, which impact on the area that is projected, uh, where, where some sort of forces are projected. And you have uncertainty in the velocity, so you, when you propagate, the uncertainty in position grows. So you have to live with uncertainties, uh, no matter how uh, accurate your observations are. Um, Everybody's using the covariance because it's the way, the easiest way to uh, represent the uncertainty. We all know that the covariance may not be realistic, and in most of the cases it is not realistic um, because of several reasons. Uh, first one, all, not all the noises are Gaussian, which is the first assumption for our covariance. Um, second, we cannot model all the dynamics perfectly well and uh, we may skip some errors that are not accounting in the propagation of the covariance, so um, it is not realistic. Um, but the pro other propagation techni techniques uh, of the uncertainty with more realism um, are more uh, consuming, mm -hmm. uh, time consuming, so they are not normally used up to now. And what we are observing is that people are using uh, techniques to filter out uh, different cases in order to evaluate which is the worst case uh, within a reasonable values of the covariances. Instead of trying to have a perfect theory to propagate it, to constrain the limit or the error you can make in that propagation. So there is a lot of work now on research on okay. covariance realism. But still in the research, let's say, room. There is a lot of in the research, and when we come to the application, there is a lot on constraining the uh, impact okay. of a lack of knowledge of the covariance. Mm -hmm. For example, when uh, we do conjunction analysis, we compute the risk of colliding, mm -hmm. of the two objects colliding. We, you cannot ensure that the two objects are going to collide. It, it has a probability. The probability will depend on the size of the covariance uh, ellipsoid, right? Mm -hmm. So what is done is to analyze this covariance with different scaling factors in order to quantify, if you have made a mistake in the covariance, okay. how bad it is. Uh, regarding the conjunction risk. Okay. And you scale the covariance uh, with a reasonable sizes mm -hmm. in order to, to ensure that the final conjunction risk will be within your limits mm -hmm. somehow. 
Um, so we advance in the two ways, on research theoretical aspects, but also on before we have solved the theoretical problem, we need yeah, to exactly. live with right. the, the problem. Okay, and uh, can you say something more about the conjunction analysis? I could read that you, you're uh, leading the CAPROS project in San Demos. Uh, can you yeah. say something about that? Um, CAPROS is, is a nice activity we are doing for UK Space Agency. Um, mm -hmm. They are interested in knowing um, first which are the needs of the satellite operators regarding uh, conjunction analysis, which are the needs in terms of what they would like to have now and they don't receive, which are the main difficulties they encounter. For example, are they receiving the conjunction warnings soon enough uh, to uh, execute the avoidance maneuver, to plan and execute avoidance maneuver? Are they receiving uh, accurate enough data? Or we need the SST system uh, providers need to evolve from that. Uh, they want to compare that those needs with capabilities of the SST providers, which are the, the needs the SST providers uh, identify, which are the plans they identify, uh, or they, they have decided to, to go forward in the next years in order to check if these plans match with the user community, the satellite operators need. And the third part is what, are, what the researchers are looking for. Are the researchers looking for the things the users uh -huh. identify as needs? So in this way it's quite a complex uh, overview of uh, what people uh, need and are doing in the uh, conjunction uh, review, in conjunction analysis. But it's kind of an overview project, so we are not going to go into the details of the theoretical formulation or doing our research. It's, it's just a survey and an analysis Okay. Uh, overview of, of the topic. Okay. And are you focusing on the rise of, uh, let's say, on the new space, of it's called? Uh, and because uh, I could hear a lot of uh, people talking about the risk of uh, uh, keeping the old uh, uh, paradigm once yeah. we have so many more. Subjects. Absolutely. I think we all have an eye on the, the issue of large constellation and not only large constellation, also the new space in regards to nanosatellites. Okay. So because uh, they will be much smaller, more difficult to be observed, more difficult to be catalogued, less accurate orbits. Um, together with the large constellation, so many objects in a space, much more than we have now, Together with the new sensors capability, we will be able to observe smaller objects, so we will have more possible colliders. And all these together will increase the number of possible conjunctions. And currently, um, there is a lot of manual steps in the conjunction avoidance process. This is something we have also uh, discussed with this user community we are talking about uh, in this project. Um, there is many automatic process uh, steps, but uh, finally the decision of maneuvering is kind of manual. And if you get five warnings per day. Exactly, exactly. So there is uh, also now a lot of research on uh, ways of automatizing all of this. Um, there is an issue, and this is a personal uh, opinion, is that uh, in order to fully automatize that, uh, we need to encounter a way of defining when to maneuver. Mm -hmm. Because nowadays, okay. there is not even a standardized uh, decision for that. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, uh, under the same conjunction conditions, one operator would maneuver, mm -hmm. other one wouldn't maneuver. Okay. Even one operator may maneuver in one condition and may that not maneuver in, in another condition. For example, if it is close to a orbital maintenance maneuver or not, oh, okay. if it impacts a lot on the, uh, the operation uh, activities, if it is under shadowing constraints that impact in the maneuvering. So we need to also work on a way of standardizing uh, which is the limit to maneuver? And do, do you have an idea of where's the, uh, how is it possible to define uh, what's the context in which you maneuver? Like, uh, 
maybe maybe is it something that's going to remain mild at the end of the day? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's uh, there are more issues than only technical. They are, okay. and these are more difficult to resolve sometimes than the technical aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we should have a kind of a legal framework mm-hmm. because nowadays there is no legal consideration, no no enforcement mm-hmm. on the need of maneuvering or not. So that's also something where we need to work in. Okay. And uh, is this something maybe related also to the uh, handling and how to handle the space environment in general? Uh, I heard a lot of talks about uh, by Mori Baja, uh, by UT Austin, about the fact that the catalog by the Russia is different from the one from the US. And, uh, so maybe we're dealing with the same problem mm-hmm. in different, uh, same, looking at different symptoms of the same problem. Yeah. And, uh, in this regard, do you see uh, um, utility in systems like uh, Astrograph or Celestrap by TS Kelso? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there, there are, uh, as far as, uh, as I see, there are two main um, lines of activity in the space that we're talking Those who are working on research activities and that are uh, willing to share information, and that's great because it's the only way to push forward our knowledge and uh, the work that uh, Moriba is doing with uh, Astrograph, uh, even uh, TS uh, with Thalestrack, also publishing a lot of data that helps a lot. But it's very difficult that all the stakeholders in the SST community share all data because in many cases, uh, confidentiality reasons, there are business cases Mm -hmm. behind so it's not always possible that uh, that uh, all data will be shared. Okay. But definitely, openness uh, mm-hmm. and sharing information is the only way to uh, solve a common problem, because mm-hmm. this is not an American problem or a Russian problem, a European problem, it's a worldwide problem. So I envisage that there will be an open community, uh, most in the research field, mm-hmm. and probably um, not open, but community with some agreements in between the stakeholders uh, also sharing information as it is done now. Mm-hmm. We have the public uh, data which uh, Americans uh, make available to, uh, to anybody, but uh, we also have some uh, non-public data that the Americans are sharing with um, other member states, other, other countries. So there are agreements and there will be agreements and really I hope that agreements will become uh, more often uh, existing. And one last question, I saw that you're also working on uh, near Earth objects. Uh, Are you still focusing on that in your working time and uh, if so, how? Um, We were uh, observing objects uh, in the asteroid domain Mm -hmm. and uh, the director of our observatory is uh, uh, the most prolific discoverer of asteroids in Europe, which is uh, uh, great. He has uh, very nice uh, stories, experience mm-hmm. on, on discoveries. Um, but the point is that uh, now it's very difficult to discover new asteroids uh, because there are much larger observatories uh, managed by public institutions. So it's not that easy. Uh, to, to focus on discovery of asteroids uh, because most of the big ones have already been discovered. So we have reduced the activity on that uh, field. On the contrary, we keep on uh, doing uh, more activities on the definition of missions to an asteroid and the ways of mitigating uh, the risk impact of, of this field. Of this. And uh, do you have a big overlap uh, in the theoretical background for space debris and asteroids, or is there something still to be aligned between the two? At the end of the day, uh, it's it's almost the same. We are observing objects that are moving uh, in the sky. We are computing orbits out of those observations. You change the main perturbations acting over the objects. You change the center of the reference frame, but at the end, techniques are similar. as I said, you encounter different uh, difficulties. For example, when you compute the re-entry of a space debris object, 
the evolution of that reentry is completely different to the case of an impact from an asteroid because of the relative velocity and the short time in one case of the object cross in the atmosphere. Contrary to the case of a space debris where it is crossing during the atmosphere during a long time, so you don't you, you are not able to predict the, the, the impact location that uh, that good. But at the end, we are both doing orbital dynamics, correlation, orbit determination in a similar way. Okay, I see. Thank you very much for your time. Welcome. <laughs>